Right guys, how's it going? It's been quite a while since I did my last technology video. As you know, I decided to take a much needed break simply because there wasn't a great deal happening on the tech front. And of course, as soon as I take the break, one or two pieces of very interesting information appear. I'm going to be taking a look at one of these today and at the end we'll do a little experiment which should be very interesting. Now there's an article over at WCCF by Khalid claiming that AMD was rolling out new Polaris GPU revisions with 50% better performance per watt, also being combined with a more refined binning process. It is possible that they've found a way to improve 14 nanometers at global foundries, but for me the binning process is what it's all about. And what I'm going to do is explain this as well as I can and to the best of my knowledge. Stuff like this is pretty close mostly guarded industry secrets, so there's a lot of guesswork involved. But really, this is all about just getting an understanding of what exactly has been going on with Polaris's energy efficiency, or lack thereof, that most of us believe. Now, I've been watching some YouTube as well and getting a few links from some of you, linking to some of Jay's videos. One of the first ones was this Gigabyte RX 480 G1 Gaming, which was very, very hot. This is just from Jay's video. I'll leave all the links in the description so you can check it yourself. But here we can see, this looks like Valley that's running and he's marked temperatures at 80 degrees, which is a little bit high for an aftermarket card. Fan speed's very low at 44%, which is almost certainly contributing to this. But the interesting thing was, the GPU was at 125 watts and 1288 megahertz. As you probably know already, the RX 480 has a base clock of 1266 megahertz. So it's a very tiny overclock, which is practically worthless. But really interesting is this GPU readout of 125.1 watts power. And I believe that this is the GPU only, i.e. it doesn't include the memory or anything else. It's simply the GPU chip itself. Now, Jay slaughtered this card and I wouldn't buy it either in all honesty. But a few days later, he did a video water cooling his reference RX 480, which presumably AMD provided him. He ripped off the cooler and stuck on a water block with some very interesting results. While running the Heaven benchmark, he found that the GPU was down at 104 watts. And as you might expect, at 35 degrees, the temperatures were way down as well. That's quite a difference, 22 watts between this and the Gigabyte aftermarket card. Now Jay believed that this was down to not having the fans on the card, but in actual fact, simply by reducing temperatures, you also reduce power. The higher the temperatures go, the higher power gets, and we must have been seeing some kind of effect there. But actually I believe that the reference GPU is set to a maximum of 110 watts. So what we're seeing is a good 5 or 6 watts being shaved off the power simply from the switch away from the crappy reference cooler. So that was interesting. But even more interesting was his next video. XFX had sent him one of their highest end cards and his video showed some very interesting numbers indeed with the GPU hovering around 85 to 90 watts. Again running heaven, again with a small overclock of 1288 megahertz, same as the gigabyte one, and running at a very nice 56 degrees. Effectively what we have here is three RX 480s running a benchmark flat out one of them pulling 85 watts, one of them pulling 104 watts, and one of them pulling 125 watts. That is a difference of 40 watts of power, which again I believe is on the GPU alone. 40 watts of power for what is effectively the same graphics card. So what is that all about? Well, I'm going to go back to my trusty diaper wafer calculator. What we have here is a wafer of Polaris 10, which is of course the GPU which both the RX 480 and RX 470 are based on. Now the GPU itself is 232mm square, so on a 300mm wafer like this one, you would have 251 potential good die candidates. That is 251 potential good Polaris 10 GPUs on one wafer. But again, if you've been watching my channel for a while, then you will know that not all of the GPUs on a wafer are good. Now, I don't know what the actual numbers are. It could actually be anything between 10 and maybe even 70% could be bad. In this case, I've taken a value of 60% good die and 40% bad. So that leaves us with 150 good GPUs on this wafer. Now, you might wonder what makes it bad. When the wafers are done, they get tested for open and short circuits. Global Foundries will test the wafer. They will test each die on the wafer and the bad ones will get a little pink blob. 
stuck on top of it and may even be thrown away. But in this case, we've got 60% yield and 150 good Polaris 10 dies coming off each wafer. So let's just take the good ones and work with that. So here's the thing. Most of us know AMD as a CPU and GPU company. And when we think about it, we're really thinking more about graphics cards on the desktop or maybe even in a laptop. But these GPUs and CPUs are used in many other markets. And AMD has a large embedded market where their chips are being used in stuff like medical equipment. What's this? A high-speed process for thermal cycling of DNA. Now, this will be a Polaris GPU or something like that, eventually, anyway. What's this? Some kind of robotics? They have got a bunch of products currently in use, covering a huge range of applications. And obviously, we also see AMD products in laptops. For example, the new Alienware 17 comes with the GTX 1060 as standard, but also has the option of the RX 470. And most of us are used to seeing cut down versions of graphics cards in laptops. But this Alienware 17 is actually full powered RX 470. That is the entire 32 compute units running at somewhere between 920 and 1206 megahertz, something like that. Now, the thing about laptops and all this embedded stuff, this medical equipment, stuff like this, all of these chips need to be of a certain standard. A lot of these boards will be going into very small form factors. And the last thing you want in a small form factor is a power hungry, hot GPU. And this article over at Anantech around this time last month was a real eye opener on what Polaris is capable of in terms of performance per watt. Now, if we scroll down, we can see AMD's embedded Radeon Discrete video cards, the Radeon E9550 and the E9260. Now, if you look at the stream processors, straight away you can tell which is which. This must be Polaris 10 because it's got the same amount of stream processors, 2304, as the RX 480. And this one at 896 must be based on Polaris 11. That is the much smaller version, which on the desktop is, of course, the RX 460. But what was interesting here is that the E9550 is rated with a TDP of up to 95 watts. Now, the RX 480 was rated at up to 150 watts of power. That is a massive difference. There is a slight difference here in that the memory is only rated at 7 gigabytes per second GDDR5, whereas on the RX 480, it's rated at 8. But what we actually have here is this entire board. Not this exact one. This is an older image. We don't have updated images of the Polaris board yet. But the entire board, that is the GPU, the memory, and the PCB, 8 gigabytes of VRAM, by the way, the entire board has a TDP of up to 95 watts of power compared to 150 watts of the RX 480 graphics card. A massive, massive difference. Looking at the E9260, up to 1.4 gigahertz, which is an increase of almost 20% over Polaris 11, the RX 460, and only using up to 50 watts of power on the entire board. This is a bit more like what we were expecting to see from Polaris, right? Given what we saw before, where if you remember Raja at the Computex event claimed that Crossfire RX 480s were more efficient than the GTX 1080 while running Ashes of the Singularity. Now, I read some crap about that. Some guy claiming that they meant dollar efficiency. That's nonsense. AMD meant efficiency in classic terms. That is performance per watt. Two RX 480s are slightly faster than a GTX 1080 in Ashes of the Singularity. But from what we know of the RX 480, there was no way that it could possibly be matched on power. Not those 150 watt RX 480s, but these E9550s at up to 95 watts for the entire board, it's all the same GPU. More than one of these good dies on this wafer. Now, here's something that a lot of people may not realize. All of these GPUs, the good ones, they're not all the same. In actual fact, no two GPUs, no two chips that have ever existed are identical. They all have slight differences, slightly different transistor lengths. Some just don't work at all, as we've already discussed. It's this variance, this variability from GPU to GPU, which causes the different performance per watt characteristics. This is why you can get a Polaris 10 GPU using up to 95 watts on the entire board and also a Polaris 10 GPU, which pulls 125 watts for the GPU itself. And this has always happened. It happens with Intel. 
it happens with NVIDIA, but AMD appear to have taken it to entirely new lengths this time around. If we take these 150 good chips that are left off the wafer, it may only be that 5% of them are good enough to be used as one of these embedded cards. Maybe 50% of them are good enough to go to Dell or HP or any company that is making laptops. And to be frank, us guys that are on the desktop, we are at the very bottom of the barrel when it comes to the quality of the chip inside our graphics cards. It's all about money and it's all about catering to specific markets. The same Polaris GPUs, Pro WX series, it's all pretty similar stuff. Workstation cards, all of that. These cards are selling for around about a thousand dollars. All that embedded stuff may be even selling for more. The best quality GPUs go to these applications. Then ones with better performance per watt characteristics go into laptops because you need to have better performance per watt in these kind of form factors. So if you can imagine that out of these 150 good dies, maybe 50 of them are going to actual graphics cards. Your RX 480s, your RX 470s. And when you're already using the worst of the wafer, you may as well just increase the voltages in order to hit that target clock speed of say 1266 megahertz. Effectively what it means is, economically, you get more good dies at higher clock speeds, so long as you're willing to throw performance per watt out of the window, enter the RX 480. Polaris is a very, very efficient architecture, but in most cases, your RX 480s, your RX 470s, it's only mediocre. And this is why. And this is why I believed that there must be an RX 490. In that infamous video where I claimed that, you know, there's no way that AMD would simply release a 90 watt graphics card in this segment. There had to also be a faster graphics card. Well, there was. In the past, cards like this XFX one that Jay got, 85 watts, they would have been overclocked to 1450 megahertz or so. And in this case, Jay's card actually reached 1490 megahertz, I believe, and was still only drawing 150 watts. This would have been an RX 490 in a previous generation. But in this case, for whatever reason, maybe it's because 14 nanometers is still quite new and global foundries are still pretty new to making GPUs. So perhaps the yields just were not there. But for whatever reason, it's pretty clear that this XFX card that Jay got could easily be 15% faster than the average RX 480. And in the past, it would certainly have been a different card. The good news is, over time, the process will improve, yields will improve, and the mix of better chips will also improve, as the process just naturally improves towards better characteristics. What AMD is likely to do is rebin and rebrand the RX 480 as the RX 580 next year. I expect this to be maybe a 175 watt card with clock speeds of around 1400 plus megahertz. It's basically the same silicon on a naturally improving process and it would have made a huge difference to Polaris had we seen this at the start. I believe AMD's got kind of lazy here and they should have made a higher tier card out of these better parts. This also brings us to the question of the kind of things AMD were saying it wasn't a lie. They do have these parts. They always had these parts. But at some point, they realized that the average RX 480 was not going to meet these kind of characteristics that they had been telling us about for months. This is something that they really need to work on because it harms their image and it basically just pisses people off. Now, as I said at the start, I'm going to do a little experiment here on the same subject of Polaris' efficiency. If you remember way back... Last December, almost a year ago, AMD demoed Polaris 11, showing incredible performance per watt. I made a video on it. It was actually one of my first tech videos, and they showed phenomenal performance per watt while running Star Wars Battlefront. Now, I read a lot of forums because I like to know what people are saying about these things. And basically on this topic of Polaris' efficiency, the general consensus is AMD just flat out lied, and that benchmark was a lie. And while reading through a Vega Navi rumor thread, I noticed a poster saying that nobody had actually tested Polaris 11 and got even close to what AMD claimed in this demo. So AMD's numbers were a case of fairy tales and unicorns. With the RX 460 reviews, there was no chance that Polaris 11 had anything like that kind of performance per watt. They simply fooled people no matter how much you try and deny it. So I just thought, well, why not actually just try that out? I do, of course, have an RX 460. 
Right, so here we go, Star Wars Battlefront. You can see that I'm using MSI Afterburner for all the stats in the center of the screen. At the bottom of the screen, we can see my power meter. Now I'm running at AMD settings of minus 20% power on the CPU. My CPU is an i7, however, not an i5, so I expect it will use a little bit more power. Right now, the GPU is set to the stock 1220 MHz. And we can see it's only drawing around about 100 watts of power right now. The GPU itself is drawing around 37 watts of power though. And now that we're in the game proper, we can see 106, 107 watts. So that's a little bit higher than the 86, 87 watts that AMD showed. But this is at 1220 megahertz. Right, so now we've got 850 megahertz on the core and we're running at 0.83 volts. Straight away we can see the GPU is down to under 20 watts and we are still locked at 60 frames per second. Looking at the power, we are down to 86 watts which is exactly the same as what AMD had. And again, I am running an i7 here. On top of that, I have three solid state drives. In the AMD system they tested on, they only had one. So there's another two watts of power. And I am also running in a rather large case with four fans. The AMD test system was a mini ITX case. It probably only had one or two fans in it. All these little one, two watts is adding up. So this is why I'm running around 89 watts as opposed to 86 watts in their test. But it's pretty obvious. The FPS is locked at 60 frames per second and under 90 watts of power. What's even more interesting here though, as you already know, Polaris 11 was chopped on the desktop, the RX 460. This one only has 14 compute units, whereas the one they tested on probably had 16 compute units. So that actually means that it would be more efficient than what I am running right now. So this is just a simple bog standard RX 460 with 14 compute units, running Star Wars Battlefront, locked at 60 frames per second, even drops below 80 watts of power. Fairy tales and unicorns, guys. Even inside the canyon, 86, 87 watts of power. So that appears to clear that up. Right, so that's pretty much it for this one, guys. It's been a while, I enjoyed making this video. Just be aware that I will not be throwing out videos with the regularity that I was previously. Not yet. The skills here in Sweden are on holiday next week. I'm actually going back to Scotland for a week next month as well. I will, however, be taking a look at the GTX 1050 Ti and the 1050. Surprisingly good performance from that card for that kind of class. As usual, the price is maybe a little bit wrong though. We'll take a look at that though at some point. There is of course also the not so small matter of the master plan. I'm sure many of you have already heard that the PS4 Pro is essentially a dual GPU. And there might be one or two other little things in there as well. We'll see how it goes and I'll catch you later guys.